Connected by Any Means Necessary on Radio Sputnik in Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Eugene Perrier, here with Sean Blackman. And as always, we're your guide to connecting the political, social, and economic movements shaping the world around us. And we are happy to be back with you, turning our attention here to some of the politics of the Middle East, as it were. And we are very happy to be joined for this conversation by journalist, hip-hop artist, and now author Marcel Cartier to talk about his new book, Sir Kefetin. Hopefully I said that right, A Narrative of the Rojava Revolution. Well, thanks a lot for having me, Eugene. It's always a pleasure, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Marcel, I was wondering if you could start uh, by actually breaking down the title, uh, Sir Captain, just what that means and how it re- uh, relates here to the uh, Rojava Revolution. Sure. I mean, well, Sir Captain is basically a Kurdish word in the Kormanji dialect, which essentially means victory. So it's uh, something that's said as a, a sort of revolutionary greeting or, you know, something that you might say to a comrade upon departure. You know, if you want to wish your comrade well, you would say Sir Keftin. So uh, when I traveled to both northern Iraq and northern Syria two years ago to uh, initially not even to write this book, I had no intention of, of writing a book or even writing anything really concrete on this issue. That was the word that I probably heard the most often in, you know, just day-to-day conversations. One of the only words, frankly, I was able to uh, really understand. My my Kurdish didn't become too much better by the time I I left, unfortunately. But yeah, I mean, it was it was a word that you know I think really resonates and, and has resonated with me ever since my trip. Um, I would just say. You know, when I traveled to the Middle East, or so-called Middle East, um, again, it was about two years ago uh, this time, actually February 25th of 2017 is when I I took a flight from Germany to uh, Suleimania in northern Iraq, and uh, from there ended up crossing the, the border over to Syria, at that time in the midst of, I think, the fifth year or sixth year of the so-called civil conflict, really, a, a proxy war as we know. You know, but my intention for going there was really one which was inspired by a dear comrade, dear brother of mine, Mehmet Aksoy, who unfortunately passed away. He was killed by ISIS in uh, Raqqa in September of 2017. But it was through conversations with him. We knew each other from London, and we had bonded over, you know, our love of, of uh, revolutionary books, essentially, and uh, in particular, his fascination with George Jackson and the Black Panther Party, and kind of relating that to the uh, the Kurdish struggle against uh, colonialism in in the Middle East and in his own context. Uh, so he was somebody who inspired me to to take that trip and was able to facilitate or help to facilitate this uh, this travel with a revolutionary youth delegation from Europe, which would in turn be able to open me up to being one of the only journalists at that time to actually gain access to the civil structures which had you know which had been set up since 2012 in the predominantly Kurdish areas of of northern Syria, of course, also uh, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-religious. Um, it's a very diverse place, actually. So, you know, I, like basically what I had the opportunity to do was to spend about a month uh, observing and participating on, on some level in, in the structures that had been set up. And then coming back to Europe after that, realized that actually there was, a, there was a lack of information, particularly in the English language. There seems quite a lot, for example, in the German language, but uh, not so much in English that really talked about these civil structures and uh, what they meant for the people of the region. And just a lot of confusion, I think, in, in general about uh, Kurdish politics and the the position of uh, these forces in countries like Iraq, like Turkey, uh, like Iran, and like Syria, which uh, is where the the Kurdish diaspora or the Kurdish homeland is essentially centered. Yeah. And, you know, on that note, uh, could you break down a little bit of the historical roots of the Rojava revolution and how some of these structures you're describing sort of came to be? Sure, definitely. Well, I mean, maybe it's helpful to just explain even what Rojava means. Rojava is a word that essentially means West. Uh, so it, it's used in the context of explaining that the area, you know, like the, the Kurds would say that the area of uh, their homeland in Syria is Rojava, Western Kurdistan. They would call uh, Turkey or the Kurdish homeland in Turkey Bakur for North, Bashur in Iraq, uh, Rojilat in, in Iran. So it, it really literally just means Western Kurdistan. Um, 
So this is not, you, you can't really look at what transpired in 2012, where essentially you had a, a civil war situation. You had the Syrian Arab army, which was preoccupied with, of course, fighting uh, Salafists and uh, reactionary forces in, in groups like the so-called Free Syrian Army. Uh, and then you had a situation where essentially there was an agreement between the Syrian Arab army and the, the Kurdish forces that much of the, the north of the country would be left to so-called um, self, self-government. self In other words, that the, the, the Kurdish forces would, uh, Kurdish forces led by the People's Protection Units, YPG, and the Women's Protection Units, the YPJ, would be able to assert um, sort of democratic autonomous control over their own affairs. So that was something that happened without a bullet being fired, something that happened, you know, uh, more or less by, by agreement, whether uh, direct or tacit agreement. But, you know, you really can't look at the so-called Rojava revolution without looking at the uh, uh, the politics of the Kurdish liberation movement going back at least to 1978. Uh, so that's when the Kurdistan Workers Party or the PKK was founded in Turkey. They put forward a position which differed from much of the Turkish left at the time, which said that Kurdistan is essentially a colony and should fight a classical war of, last, of national liberation, you know, similar to what was unfolding all around the world at that time, uh, countless examples in Africa, Latin America, etc., and guided by Marxist-Leninist ideology. And through, you know, now more than 40 years of, of that struggle of the PKK and affiliated groups in the countries that, um, of course, surround Turkey and the other parts of the Kurdish homeland, this was able to inspire a similar process, which ended up unfolding in in Rojava in 2012. So I, I think that without uh, sort of that historical context, understanding that this is something that, you know, its roots go back at least 40 years, four decades and tens of thousands of of people who have fought and, and have died, who have, fall, um, have fallen martyr you know, through this process, then you can't really understand uh, why this this movement has had such vitality over the course of the last now almost seven years. Yeah. And uh, I'm wondering sort of like what sort of the challenges that the, the current moment possesses for that project. Uh, you know what I mean? Because with any revolutionary process, it's uh, the way things are carry out, you know, there are complexities and contradictions that arise. And I'm just wondering how, you know, you see those things being, you know, meted out and reconciled there. Well, for sure. I mean, um, you know, when I was there in 2017, of course, it was about two years ago. So I, I'm sure the, the context has changed tremendously in the a span of time. So, on 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 the one side, I think I'm a little bit limited because, of course, I don't have that direct, uh, you know, the observation and participation that I had um, in 2017. But you know, in following it, and and I think this is is very interesting. You know, when the Battle of Kobani was unfolding in the you know the, the beginning of 2015, right? You had a situation where the world was fixated on that battle. It looked like ISIS, which which, of course, had been, um, you know, if not spearheaded, had been certainly nurtured to a degree by uh, the United States, because the United States and the Western powers and their obsession to overthrow the uh, the Ba'ath Party state in Syria, of course, gave gave rise to and tried to facilitate elements that have very Salafist and reactionary tendencies, one of those, of course, being ISIS, others being groups like al-Nusra, etc. So it looked as if ISIS was on the verge of essentially going all the way to the, uh, the Turkish border. And, and, you know, during this battle of Kobani, there was such an international outcry to the extent that in the end, the United States ended up um, joining in the fight because of this, this public pressure and facilitating airstrikes that in turn helped turn the tide and helped to push ISIS back. Of course, a contradiction. Kurdish forces know that all too well, uh, considering that for 40 years, actually, they've been fighting against Turkey, which is a NATO member, which has been backed by the United States. And it's it's quite ironic because when I was going to Rojava, one of the big, you know, one of the big concerns of, of course, people on the left is that, and, and me as somebody who has been a staunch anti-imperialist my entire life, and something that I was trying to navigate also, was what about this tactical relationship that the Kurdish forces have with the United States. And what was really interesting to me was, for example, being in Syria, crossing back over to Iraq with Kurdish forces, right, who, you know, essentially 
uh, then would go to bases manned by the PKK. When you're in Rojava, when you're in Syria, you might be getting some arms from the United States. Those same people, as soon as you cross the border, you're being bombed by Turkish jets, which are given intelligence and logistics and all types of military hardware by the United States. So it's this really interesting conversation where, you know, like, in, in the Kurdish forces are totally aware of this. They're, they're completely aware that the United States has never been a true ally, never will be a true ally. But I think the way that the war unfolded, you have all of these very, you know, like, not so easy to iron out contradictions. And, of course, like, a huge concern for a lot of the Kurdish uh, uh, community has been, well, Donald Trump says he's going to pull uh, U.S. troops out of Syria. And, of course, that was done at the very moment that uh, Trump had a phone call with Erdogan. Erdogan says, well, well, we'll go in and we'll basically mop up the rest of ISIS territory. Anybody who's been following Syria for the last seven years knows that perhaps even more so than the United States, the country that has really helped to empower and facilitate ISIS or Daesh and their moves in, the, in, in Syria has been Turkey. Right. So I think like there's all of these things that need to be resolved in terms of, you know, like a political resolution. But uh, what, what I view as positive at the moment is that there has there's always been contacts between uh, YPG, YPJ and their, their political uh, formation, the, the PYD and the Syrian uh, Arab state and uh, a willingness uh, to some degree anyway on both sides to come to a political solution which would hopefully leave the sovereignty of Syria intact to expel all foreign forces and ultimately, you know, hopefully be able to create a, a Syrian state which is more inclusive, more democratic, and um, actually takes into consideration a lot of the cultural and national aspirations of the different nationalities which live in that very, very diverse country. Yeah, and- and, you know, Marcel, I'm wondering on a personal level, because you you had an interesting uh, level of access here, just uh, what, what the experience was like for you, uh, you know, being there and seeing these things and these different structures in 2017 and just kind of uh, what it was like, you know, seeing these different things play out here. Yeah, definitely. I mean, even before I crossed the border into Syria, I was in, um, you know, Kurdish guerrilla camps in, in northern Iraq and, you know, was literally intense at night and, and having to turn off the lights because you had Turkish jets flying overhead and bombing very close by. And then, you know, like making the crossing over, making the crossing over to Syria and then, you know, actually being there and you know, being able to see really like sheer, I would say enthusiasm is the way to put it. I mean, these, you know, like you have to understand that the, the Kurdish language and Kurdish culture has, you know, historically really throughout all of the uh, the nation states in which Kurds find themselves has been banned. So, you know, all of a sudden when you have that lifted, then there's sort of an air of, um, you know, everything is new and everything is, you know, there's, there's an opportunity for new levels of creativity and just like revolutionary enthusiasm. And, you know, really, I, I think the main thing the main takeaway is the the focus on women's liberation and women's empowerment. If, if you look at the principles of not just the Rojava revolution, but of the Kurdish freedom movement, so in other words, the the revolutionary Kurdish freedom movement really led by the PKK in Turkey, uh, the main principles are the cooperative economy and communes. And I found out actually that much of, of what they're talking about in terms of cooperative economy actually comes, it seems like, from Venezuela and the Bolivarian revolutions example. Um, and then focus on social mm. ecology, so on the environment, but really the key pillar is women's liberation and women's empowerment. Uh, so I was able to see, like, not only are women organized and fighting in the, um, you know, like, I guess often overly glorified, uh, glorified to some extent in the sort of, you know, almost, you know, perverse kind of way, like these, like, beautiful Amazons and things, you know, like all, all of the women's magazines in the West have sort of like uh, sort of commodified the women, uh, you know, fighters in the in the Kurdish movement. But really on the most basic level, you saw, for example, that, you know, women are, are organizing to fight against patriarchal attitudes, uh, things like forced marriage, things like polygamy. You know, really there was an air, especially when you talk to women, of now we finally have our shackles off. Now we're able to combat some of these more reactionary tendencies, which kind of, you know, like just sat in society. Like, women's empowerment seemed to be dormant, and then all of a sudden you have this movement with 40 years of uh, of fighting for women's liberation, and they were putting that front and center. Um, and then, of course, like, for me also, 
to go into a place like Kobani, which, you know, like some people have uh, called it sort of the, the Stalingrad of the 21st century, you know, maybe not a completely apt comparison, but nonetheless, I mean, there was this monumental struggle and so many people who, um, you know, were fighting in basically door-to-door, room-to-room combat, and then actually being there and, for example, going through, you know, like discovering a tunnel which ISIS had used to uh, funnel arms from Turkey to Syria and then realizing like, oh, sh- there's a there's a skeleton of a of a, like there's like a corpse of a of an ISIS member which is still there. It made it like very very real. For example, that you know this is you know like there's tremendous human sacrifice that goes into uh, reclaiming or you know keeping keeping a hold of the city, which definitely is synonymous with that that Kurdish identity. You know, so I mean, there's plenty of examples like that. I think a lot of them probably come across um, very clearly in in the book and in and in my storytelling. But yeah, I, I would say that. I mean, I just, I just really have to say this, like Mehmet Aksoy is um, somebody who really encouraged me to write the book and somebody who encouraged me to, you know, to, to proceed with it when I felt like it wasn't really worth doing. I really owe him all the gratitude in the world. And, you know, February 25th, actually, this would have been his 34th birthday. Um, but unfortunately, he's somebody who, through his uh, struggle also using multimedia and video, ended up also dying in this fight. And then there's things like, you know, being in... In, in certain houses being welcomed by a whole uh, like group of sisters who are all in the YPJ. And then, you know, days after me leaving the country, realizing that one of them had been killed in the Turkish uh, uh, airstrike, you know, like things like that are very, you know, it, it makes it all too real. And it, you really start to understand that really on all sides in, in this conflict, but particularly on the side of the uh, YPG, YPJ, and of course the uh, multiple, you know, like tens of thousands of uh, members of the Syrian Arab army who have also died fighting against all of the reactionary currents in the country. Like, these are the true people who have who have defeated ISIS. I mean, Donald Trump can try all he wants to say that it was the United States and the Western coalition that did it. But these are the same people who initially created the problem to begin with. So we, we shouldn't have any illusions about that. Yeah, no, I think you're 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 very correct on, on that issue, and I think that obviously we're seeing kind of the in-game, in-status results of some of that and now. Just sort of seeing the players who are are left on the board. I mean, I'll just ask you this question real quick. I mean, it seems that this with the, with the imminent U.S. withdrawal here, you know, certainly that the U.S. attempted intervention there has more or less uh, not succeeded in its goals. And whatever the status quo is five years from now, it probably will not be uh, what uh, you know the Obama administration. Administration and, and U.S. imperialism was hoping when they uh, uh, started the whole game. Oh, for sure. I mean, absolutely. And, and and I think that at this point we know that you know it's the Syrian state which which remains intact. It's the reality, you know, and and from the perspective of of. The Kurdish forces, YPG, YPJ, if you were following the news a few months ago, they, they welcomed the Syrian Arab army. They said they can take Manbij, we can negotiate uh, the future. Of course, like in any political formation, like the PYD, there's different trends and different wings, and you have some which are perhaps more, you know, uh, perhaps more warm, let's say, towards the United States, and then you have others which are much more in favor of ramping up the uh, the rapprochement and, and coming to a... Um, you know, a negotiated solution for Syria. And really, like, being there, man, like, that's that's the main main takeaway. You know, this is a country that's been at war for such a long time, a war which had been imposed upon it. Um, people, whether Kurdish, Arab, Assyrian, Armenian, the multiple nationalities, multiple religions in Syria, they deserve, you know, they, they deserve all the happiness in the world and uh, a constructive future. And I, I think that I think that that future is coming. It is inevitable. And I think that the, uh, the dictate of all the imperialist forces you know, that will no longer fly in, in the country eventually. I really hope so. Mm-hmm. Well, I really appreciate you joining uh, the show here. Sir Kefton, A Narrative of the Rojava Revolution by Marcel Cartier. Get that book for sure and follow all of his journalism. Also, his hip-hop artistry, which I can highly recommend and which is always right on time as well with what's going on in the world. We're going to take a break here. By any means necessary, Radio Sputnik, Washington, D.C. We'll be back. Stay with us. By any means necessary. 